So I was, uh, I was asked by Leo and Mike Hughes to speak um, at softball. I've never done anything like this before, so you, you have to have mercy on me. You're Christians. I think you, you pretty much have to have mercy. Um, I have plenty of notes, so I won't lose place or anything like that. Um, so I want to start by saying me and an addict are the same. I've never been addicted to any substance, but we both experienced uh, pain that we were willing to do whatever it took to, uh, to get over. Um, the only difference is my healing came through the Lord instead of uh, substance. Uh, July 6th of 2021, my brother and I and some friends were driving home from Acadia in Maine. We're on vacation. Uh, we went to the National Park. It was beautiful. Um, as I'm driving, I'm driving the car. I'm on the highway going probably 70, 75, see a car maybe 100, 200 feet down. Um, There's no guardrail on the highway, so try to picture that in your mind. We're in New Hampshire. Um, Just inexplicably turns, hits us. I do my best to get out of the way. We fly about 50 feet. I mean, we're in the left lane, in the fast lane, and I fly all the way to the trees. We we flew, you know, pretty far. Um, And I remember... uh, I just, I climb out and I hear the horrors of my friends. I hear people screaming. Obviously, everyone stopped. Um, I smell the engine. Some things you just, you never really kind of get rid of, you know. Um, And uh, I was in pain physically, but my body was also numb at the same time. It was was pretty horrific. Um, And unfortunately, my brother died instantly. So I'm 30 now. He was 26. It happened two years ago. So um, we were very close. He was my best buddy. Uh, but don't, don't pity me because I do believe that he is in heaven. So while it does hurt, um, I'm able to say this and, you know, not really get choked up like I, I used to. Um, it's because I, I really do have that kind of hope now in the future. Um, so I saw a lot of horrific things. I experienced a lot of horrific things. I was tormented. The pain was insurmountable, and uh, the reason why I say an addict and I are the same is because drugs and alcohol looked pretty appealing at that time. I, uh, I started off in a Christian home with amazing parents, perfect childhood, uh, but life can take you obviously all sorts of ways. That's the only bad thing that's really ever happened uh, in my life. Um, the reason I share all this is because earthly uh, pleasures have such a pull when you're in pain and this tragedy really unlocked um, a different part in my brain. I have extreme empathy for a person addicted to uh, anything, substance or just anything. I'm, I'm no doctor, but I was talking with Leo before, and I think addiction really comes from a place of pain. So if you come from a place of pain, that makes us family. I know exactly how you feel now. And uh, it's weird. God blesses you in different ways. I would have never been able to relate to you in that way, but now I can. So if you told me uh, in the hospitals, I'm waiting my parents to drive five hours or whatever to come up and take me home, that there was a pill or I could take a couple of shots of something or inject anything and the pain would go away, even if it was for eight hours, uh, sign me up. I would have done it. Um, Even knowing that the future effects of my health would have been just awful. It doesn't matter. When you're in that much pain, you don't care. Uh, So we are very similar. I'm a Christian, and I have been pretty much my whole life. So I knew that when you're confronted with unimaginable pain, that seeking the power of Jesus, seeking the the help of... It it can be very powerful and healing when you seek Jesus, but when you seek the world, um, it's just more like a Band-Aid. And I didn't want a Band-Aid. I wanted surgery. I wanted to actually be better, not just feel better. Um. And I'm truly sorry if you took more and more pain than I have and you've gone through more and more um, and something like that, and it took you more pain to find out that, that conclusion that I had already learned, luckily, because it was instilled in me in in a young age. So I just happened to be right with God. So really, that's kind of the intro of what I was going to say. I only have, I don't have like an hour or anything like that. So when I... When I say intro, it's not like it's a long thing or anything. But uh, um, 
So my main point here is I happen to be right with God when that happens. So how do you get right with God? How can you have actual healing? Um, And I think he healed me with knowledge through reading the Bible. And it wasn't some out-of-body healing with a seance or anything weird or medication or anything. It was, it was supernatural, but it was also practical. It was a practical healing that took place. And the Bible shows us the real problem. And the problem is sin, ourselves. At the root of addiction, sin is actually the problem. And we are all stricken with the disease of sin, no matter what, we cannot be healed. We can't do anything on our own to be healed. We needed someone to step in and heal us. Everyone, from someone really low on society's priority list, maybe a homeless person, society just throws them away. That person needs to be saved. Then They need to be healed. Mary, the earthly mother of Jesus, that she needed to be healed. Uh, everyone needs saving. In Luke 1, 46 and 47, Mary actually says, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Even she knew that she really did need a Savior. Um, I used this example a couple uh, weeks ago at our softball game, although we may never play again because there was 20 feet of rain yesterday um, and now, but uh, I think Job probably was the most impactful book in the Bible for me to read. I've read it several times now due to the pain and suffering and so on. Um, I'm reading a a little bit here from chapter 9. I'm going to jump around because it was written very long ago. He repeats himself a little bit. Um, So this is in Job chapter 9 here. How can a person be declared innocent in God's sight? If someone wanted to take God to court, would it be possible to answer him even once in a thousand times? For God is so wise and so mighty, who has ever challenged him successfully? So who am I that I should try to answer God or even reason with him? Even if I were right, I would have no defense. I could only plead for mercy. And even if I summoned him and he responded, I'm not sure he would listen to me. If it's a question of strength, he's the strong one. If it's a matter of justice, who dares to summon him to court? Though I am innocent, my own mouth would pronounce me guilty. Though I am blameless, it would prove me wicked. Um, There's 30 more chapters of mankind's best arguments at the time to explain why God allowed this specific suffering to a good man, uh, such as Job. But he finally reaches a conclusion in chapter 20. He says, I am nothing. How could I ever find the answers? I will cover my mouth with my hand. I have said too much already. I have nothing more to say. In a couple of translations, he says, I am vile. He's, he thinks of himself as just being disgusting. He can't offer anything. And I think that is such an intelligent conclusion. Uh, the very best mankind has to offer simply isn't good enough for a perfect God. And that is where biblical Christianity is different than every other religion. Um, I had a a baseball coach um, in high school who became a Buddhist, and it it worked for him in this life. It made him more merciful. It made him friendly. We all loved him. He was very fun. Um, But at the end of the day, his sins weren't forgiven. So I wouldn't really call that healing. Uh, Job realized he needed an intermediary or a lawyer between him and God. So like I said, this book was written thousands and thousands of years ago, but it foreshadows the coming of Jesus Christ thousands of years later, who can actually stand in our place and took the punishment that we genuinely deserve so that we don't have to spend eternity paying for our own sins and justice can be served through through Jesus instead of us dying. Now remember, Job was was a good man. He was so good that he would offer sacrifices to the Lord on behalf of his children just in case they sinned in their own heart. And he came to that conclusion. Uh, Isaiah was a prophet of God, an awesome, awesome guy, probably one of the only good people in Israel at that time. Uh, and let's hear what he has to say when he saw a vision of heaven. Isaiah 6, 5, he says, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Uh, what about John the Baptist? Jesus called him the greatest man who ever lived. So surely he didn't need saving uh, if Jesus said that. John said, I am not worthy to loosen the thongs of his sandals. Uh, Feet are obviously rather gross, but back then it was even worse because uh, they didn't have showers or soap or anything, or paved roads. So it was 
really gross. <clears throat> I encourage you, um, well, I skipped a step. Um, so the theme is that we are, we are all the same. I'm in the same spiritual boat as Mary, Job, Isaiah, John the Baptist, everyone here. And uh, I might not have ever been addicted to anything, but we, we do all need saving. And I encourage you, if you want actual healing, not just a band-aid, you need to become a Christian and have your sins forgiven. And I would like to close with John 4, 42. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves. And we know that this man really is the savior of the world. John 4 starts uh, with Jesus talking to a Samaritan woman at a water well. And she runs and goes and tells everyone about her amazing encounter and that Jesus was God. But uh, I love this verse because um, I feel like I can apply it to my own life especially well now. I, uh, I hear about people being restored and made new at church or in the Bible. You know, we hear about all these different b- biblical heroes um, of ours, but now I've actually seen it firsthand. I, for 27 and a half years, I had a perfect life by human standards. Um, and uh, I would still consider it a perfect life. I mean, just because that happens, it's almost like the Lord can unlock a different perspective for you. It makes you grateful in a way um, that you never could have. You know, obviously we don't like pain, but the Bible says the purpose of pain is to draw you closer to him. And he, he's not doing that because he's an egomaniac. He's doing it because um, it's really good for you to get to know him. So when he wants you to pray to him, it's not like you're telling him of anything or you're letting him know about a certain situation. He just wants you to be close to him because it's good for you. He doesn't really get anything out of it, but he knows that he's so great that you benefit from it. <clears throat> so my free advice is uh, read the Bible every day, study under good biblical mentors, and get to know who God is. The more you know about him, the more you want to praise him, pray to him, and read more about him. And when you're focused on furthering that relationship, the pain of life just sort of dissipates. Um, agree with God that you have sinned against him and turn away from your sin and you will be saved forever. And that's an awesome, awesome promise. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you, for, thank you for tonight. Lord, thank you for the gift of fellowship. Lord, we thank you so much that you give us all these examples in the Bible. Lord, we thank you that the Bible is totally complete. Lord, we thank you for <clears throat> Job's suffering so that it can give us hope. Lord, we thank you for sending your son to die on the cross for us. Lord, help us to just commit the rest of this week to you. Help us to just create great habits in ourselves, Lord, and help us to just shine it to the world and help us to tell our story to others. Father, I bless the rest of this night in your name. And uh, in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you.